Hi, everyone. Welcome to the IWRA webinar on how land matters for flood risk management. Um, it is a very exciting event because it is not coming to you as usual from many different parts of the world um, with speakers everywhere, but in fact coming to you direct live from Rigia, Latvia at the uh, EU cost land for flood event um, workshop that they're having right now. So we're going to hear their panel directly um, when they start here in just a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and give everyone just one or two more minutes to uh, log in and then we'll get started um, and hope to see everyone here pretty soon. Thanks for joining us. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining us here at the uh, IWRA Water International Water Resources Association webinar for how land matters for flood risk management. Like I said a few minutes ago, what we're doing today is not coming to you directly from uh, many different sources with speakers everywhere all around the world, but we're coming to you live direct from the um, EU cost action land for flood workshop towards the interdisciplinary understanding of private land for flood risk management. Um, it's kind of a mouthful, but it's uh, happening live in Rigia Latvia right now. And so we are having their panel broadcast to you live and direct. Um, and this is gonna be a really interesting event because it builds on some of our previous work um, and features some of the same speakers, but bringing to you a new and different exciting angle. Um, really engaging about how to prevent floods, particularly river floods and riparian floods, um, but using traditional and untraditional uh, private land. So, um, you know, what I'd like to remind you today here is that our panelists include uh, Thomas Hartman from Wageningen University in the Netherlands, Jokan Schans from TU Dresden, and Simon McCarty from the Flood Hazard Research Center in Middlesex University, UK, uh, Lucas Luschner, University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, Austria, and Linke Slavia from the Jan Evangelia University in the Czech Republic. That was a mouthful, sorry about that. Um, this webinar is hosted, as always, from the International Water Resources Association. The IWRA is an international network of researchers and practitioners who work on a multidisciplinary range of water resource issues. We are a nonprofit, non-governmental educational organization. Uh, the IWRA provides a global knowledge-based forum for bridging disciplines and geographies by connecting professionals, students, individuals, corporations, and institutions who are concerned with the sustainable use of the world's water resources. We're really happy to have you here today with us. And um, we have a really great panel of people who have been active and, and working on this and researching on these issues here for, for many years. Um, and like I said earlier, as many of you may not realize, this is not based on a special issue of Water International, our flagship publication, but is actually a live stream directly from the European Union Cost Action uh, Land for Flood Workshop towards the interdisciplinary understanding of private land for flood risk management in Latvia. Um, this has been a really great collaboration for us and builds on an earlier special issue policy brief and webinar that we conducted with Professor Thomas Hartman a few years ago. And today we hear about these non-traditional measures against river floods and how this can increase uh, using private lands can increase resilience uh, and decrease the risk. Um, so what we will do here today is a little bit of a different format from people who might have tuned in usually. Uh, what we're going to do is go directly to the event. Um, hear the panel, and you won't be hearing from me at all between any of the speakers. And then um, 
we will try to get in some of the questions at the end. Uh, so as, as usual, you can ask your question there. It should be on the go to webinar control panel questions. It's right there on the side. Um, go ahead and um, uh, type your question in there. And if we have time at the end, we will try to get your questions relayed to our panel. Um, keep in mind that it is a shorter event and we have to share our panel with an actual live audience um, who also has a lot of their own questions. So please be understanding about that. Um, but that's how we'll do it. And then you'll hear from me at the end. So thank you so much for tuning in today and let's go directly to Rigia. Try to get this un to unmute the uh, the panel there. Okay, can we start? Okay, so welcome everybody to this um, very special EWRA webinar uh, broadcasting today from the um, from the uh, uh, cost action land for flood. My name is uh, Thomas Hartmann. I'm the, happen to be the vice chair of this uh, action. Lenka Slavikova is chairing the whole action. And I would like to very briefly introduce um, the topic before I introduce uh, the speakers. Um, so this uh, cost action of land for flood asked the question about how does land matter for flood risk management? So what is really, what is really uh, the role of land, if you want? Um, and um, we launched an, an, an initiative called Land for Flood and Cost Action with a full title of Natural Flood Retention on Private Land. Um, which is all about the question how land and flood risk management come together. It's funded by the European Commission's program COST. Um, it's a network program uh, where we have participants from 30 countries coming together on a regular basis um, for the whole period of, uh, of the whole four years. Um, and um, this, um, this webinar is very much about a first outcome of, uh, that, uh, of that network. It's uh, a policy brief that we jointly published with EWRA. Um, and this policy brief very briefly, of course, informs about how la private land matters in flood risk management. Um, just to give you a very brief context, now try to reduce that to three minutes. Um, if you think about how land and flood risk management matters, we can think of uh, the different areas, how it might matter in terms of the uh, geographical area. Land in the hinterland, for example, before the water reaches the streams can be retained and that has an effect on, uh, on flood risk management. Or you can store land in large areas, uh, you can store water in large areas along the rivers. Um, and finally, if that doesn't work, you need to adapt cities to become more resilient, more adaptive if you, if you want to flood risk. And um, in this respect, we address in that cost action those different um, areas from different disciplinary angles with different working groups. So we look at natural water retention measures. Um, and of course, if you think about uh, retention measures in the hinterland, those land, th this land is mostly privately owned. Um, and the difficult question is how to get to that land and also what is the hydrological effect of small scale retention in the hinterland. Um, so this is the first thing we addressed in the policy brief. But then also we addressed the issue of uh, flood storage along the river. If you have a river um, and you ha usually have uh, a, a populized area, so there are, uh, 
there are um, upstream and downstream parties. The question is always where to leave the, the, the abundant water that comes from upstream, flood the upstream area or the downstream area, and both of them we know that for a long time, well, we prepared for ourselves for, by building dikes, um, and if you do that all along the river, uh, the effect of that is that we accelerate the flood and that we have inundations all over the place. And the question is, how do we get back to making space for rivers if we have an urbanized area with, with uh, embankments and dikes all over the place? That essentially is a question of land policy, because the land behind the dikes is usually occupied. So that's the second topic, if you want, the hinterland along the rivers. Um, but then also we talk about adapting urban areas, adapting the resilient city. If you look at the picture, that would be the ideal situation, right? From the terms of flood, flood risk management. So adaptive building, buildings that are adapted to the, to the idea of getting flooded. But you, if you look at reality, then landowners, uh, they could do a lot of things for, your, for their houses, local measures, if you want, to protect their homes, like adaptive users, putting installations on, under the roof and stuff like that. But landowners all over the place, they, they tend to, tend to not, not apply those measures. They tend to not do that. And this cost action is really all about those issues. And with, with four presentations, four short inputs, we would like to discuss and address the main issues. Um, those four presentations will come along with um, four main publications that we are la launching at the moment or have launched um, in this cost action network. The first one, um, will be presented by Jochen Schanze, um, uh, and he is from uh, TU Dresden in Germany and the Leibniz Institute for Ecological Development. And um, he will present a special issue um, on land for flood risk management, in particular um, the catchment-wide and cross-disciplinary perspective on land for flood. After that, we will hear um, uh, Simon McCarthy from, from the Flood Hazard Research Center in the UK. Um, uh, and he will talk about nature-based flood risk management on private land. Uh, and this will be all about uh, real cases and how to get to, to the land and what are the issues here. Uh, Lukas Löschner from the University of Life Science in Vienna, the BOKU, will talk um, about uh, policies and instruments for mobilizing private land. So how to deal with the landowners then um, for flood risk management. And finally, the fourth presenter will be Lenka Slavikova, also the chair of the whole cost action, um, talking about financial schemes for flood recovery and their impact on flood resilience. So then we are talking about what happened after the, uh, what happens after the flood, flood event. So that's uh, the very brief introduction um, on the whole cost action. And I'm very happy to, uh, first of all, announce if you're interested in the cost action, please look at the website, www.landforflood.eu. Um, and then I would like to hand over to Jochen Schanzer from TU Dresden and Leibniz Institute for Ecological Development and Regional Development, yeah. and regional development um, to give you a presentation. So um, Jochen, please, the floor is yours. Thomas, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Now it's a pleasure for me to go ahead and to start with the first uh, presentation. This will be available in a few seconds. So thank you very much for installing the presentation. So um, as Thomas already mentioned, I'm, I'm going to present you a special issue um, on uh, with the title Land for Flood Risk Management, a catchment wide and cross-disciplinary perspective. The special issue has been uh, prepared by authors from a network called uh, Floodland and uh, also from authors of the um, Land for Flood Cost Action. And uh, it has been published in the Journal of Flood Risk Management. Now, why a special issue on land and, and uh, floods? I think it's clear that land plays a major role in flooding and there is a lot of research on this. However, uh, explicitly, consideration of uh, land is still lacking, and this can be easily seen if we address uh, these three questions. How do different kinds of land use and land management influence the flood generation? What exactly are the processes? How can we model and describe them? The second question, whose land should be used to retain water or mitigate vulnerability? Is not land in general. It should be really site-specific clarified which contribution can uh, be provided by which land. 
And last but not least, uh, least uh, which policy instrument allow for accessing and governing the land? Land is private, so uh, in many cases, so we cannot just uh, ask the people to give the land for uh, a risk re um, reduction activities. Now, against this background, the issue explores the various meanings of land for flood risk management from the few of um, disciplines relevant for um, um, the topic, and uh, this means to involve natural scientists, engineers, but also social science and uh, ec uh, economics. And um, as a state of the art, we can say, particularly for rivers and river basins, that there are major, three major options, and I think Thomas has already perfectly introduced these three options to deal with um, flood risks um, in general. The first is to retain runoff in the headwaters of catchment through decentralized retention of water before it reaches the network, the first option. The second one, to slow the flood propagation down and to cut the peak discharge in the river network, for instance, by modifying the flood conveyance or by the creation of centralized water retention through polders, for example, or flood defense measures like flood walls or flood dikes. And third, to foster resilient settlements through mitigation of their exposure and vulnerability. Now, in recent studies, we even see relocation of settlements in uh, flood-prone areas. And all of these options need land, but in different ways and in site-specific ways. And this is what uh, the special issue is about. Now, I'm going to um, uh, present you the uh, articles which have been uh, uh, provided uh, with this special issue. Um, according to these three options. I start with a decentralized flood retention. Observations and model-based um, analysis show us that uh, decentralized flood retention uh, is inversely, uh, inversely correlated with the size of the catchment and the severity of an event. So, um, however, there is a strong discussion on uh, the meaning of natural water retention measures or so-called uh, nature-based solutions. And there is uh, the question, what are exactly the effects uh, uh, and how can these measures be synchronized on the catchment scale to make advancements and maybe contribute to um, the decentralized flood retention? In our issue, Collentine and Futter show that those measures require more land than the traditional, traditional gray infrastructure. So more land is needed to realize such nature-based solutions. And, uh, but this, this land uh, needs uh, accessibility uh, at sites which are de determined by the biophysical processes. Not any land can be used, particular land, which contributes to the flood propagation uh, or the flood generation. And this land is often owned by private landowners and therefore the land is not accessible in the first instance. Now let's take the second option, the conveyance, the decent, uh, centralized retention and also the uh, defenses. As we know uh, from previous studies, uh, effective measures to slow the flood propagation down and to cut the peak discharge of the flood wave requires site-specific land accessibility, but the land accessibility, the uh, lack of these and the resistant landowners are crucial constraints for implementing such measures. So engineers do perfect studies and say, okay, this would be the potential of a flood polder, but then trying to implement this, it takes decades partly to convince people. And this is uh, visible in the two articles from Millman and McCarthy in the special issue. Um, what are these constraints and how they hinder implementation of such measures? And then uh, regarding these um, hydrological and hydraulic um, uh, processes, Bornstein and Paul explore uh, the hydraulic uh, influences on, um, of the land roughness. So roughness plays a major role in roughness in the uh, hydrodynamic processes, but this is influenced by land use, and therefore the controlling and steering land use uh, is an important uh, aspect. And uh, then uh, Jübner um, uh, underpins the meaning of extreme events based on uh, his uh, observations from a 2013 event in Central Europe and he uh, emphasizes the need to combine uh, uh, spatial planning with uh, preparation for extreme events. Now the third option, hopefully you remember, was urban resilience and resilience is uh, somehow defined as um, a minimal impact of inundation due to people and assets and quick recovery 
after an event and this then we could call um, the flood resilient city as uh, Thomas already mentioned and in our paper Pant et al describe how impacts of um, the critical infrastructure propagate outside even uh, the flood zone so uh, therefore it's important to properly analyze this infrastructure and to have uh, land available to mitigate exposure and vulnerability of this uh, um, this um, uh, infrastructure and uh, they also clearly say where are uh, the gaps and where future research has to be go now aside to these three options there are some cross-cutting points um, which we also address in this special issue um, uh, for example, Colentine and Fata conclude that inventing proper compensation schemes is one key to successful implementation, and there are a lot of trade-offs. Of course, there are also co-benefits, but there are also a lot of trade-offs, and they describe these trade-offs in their paper. Millman et al. describe how landowners understand and respond to land use restrictions, because it's their land and they need to use this land. And McCarthy et al. illustrate how compensation schemes and the perception of landowners of these schemes matter, uh, and they uh, take advantage of an example from the UK. Tarlock and Albrecht, two lawyers, uh, one from the US, one from Germany, investigate the constitutional legal aspect, aspects of property rights and flood risk management, and they compare the institutional systems in the US, in Canada, and in Germany. Um, and then Lear and Lerscher, uh, Lucas Löschner will also present afterwards, address the issue of land governance on the catchment, uh, catchment scale, and they conclude that governance approaches such as upstream-downstream negotiation demand for a combination with formal instrument of land policy, so combine the informal with the formal uh, instruments. And uh, finally, uh, Mackett et al. explore upstream-downstream interrelation, but in this time they apply the game theory and see that the game theory could be a means of uh, creating uh, and developing new instruments for dealing with uh, the uh, centralized flood storage. And finally, um, uh, Slovikova in her paper addressed the effects of flood recovery scheme on land use, and she shows that the public schemes for flood expenditure and flood recovery provide an important trigger for behavior of land users uh, after and before an event, even uh, triggering their preparedness to contribute to flood risk reduction. Now, I hope you got interested by uh, this brief overview of this special issue. All 11 contributions um, uh, refer to the flood risk system and to land as a subject of governance, and they mainly identify the research gaps and uh, also the gaps in practice. And uh, of course, these gaps are further addressed in uh, the cost action, which Thomas has uh, introduced at the beginning the land for flood cost action um, funded by the European Union and if you want to access the papers they are available at the website of the Journal of Flood Risk Management. With this I thank you very much. Thank you. I will not spend too much time, only one comment. Um, and that is, you see that in this first special issue that is already published, we identified a couple of issues that led to further publications. You will hear Lukas Löschner and you will hear Lenka Slavikova and also Simon McCarthy talking about publication projects that are about to emerge out of that published uh, activity. Um, and uh, we are coming now to um, a book project that is not yet published, but in the process. And the further we go, the, the less the publications are finalized. And um, this is also um, an, a, a trigger, if you want, and also a, a, a plea for considering to, to become active, to publish on those issues. Um, Simon, can I ask you to take the floor and present the ongoing book project? Thank you. Yes, as um, Thomas says, uh, this is a, a book that's um, in development. Um, essentially, it's been published by Springer, and the editors there you can see listed Thomas Lenker and myself. Um, hopefully, the book will look a lot better than is uh, portrayed there in that mock-up. Um, but essentially, uh, the title is Nature-Based uh, Flood Risk Management on Private Land. The proposal for the book was based on the requirement for land and that that land is mostly privately owned. 
there's a requirement for diverse stakeholder involvement from many different disciplines and the challenges related to the um, interaction of those different disciplines and the different languages that they speak and the different agendas that they come from. So the interaction is not only technical expertise, but it asks for land use planning, economics, property rights, sociology, landscape planning, ecology, hydrology, agriculture, and many other disciplines as well that we're yet to discover. The case study locations are primarily in Northern Europe. So we have a, po a Polish forest uh, case study, two cases in the Czech Republic, uh, Belgium in the Flanders region, Austrian Rhine Valley uh, case study, um, Elbe uh, Brandenburg in Germany, and Okensen Beck in the Netherlands. The case studies are structured around a key issue that seems to have arrived over the last, uh, last meeting that we had in Prague, but also at this meeting, and that is of scale. So essentially, we're looking at a, a small scale uh, activities that might be undertaken on private land, uh, which are, the cases are in uh, Poland and uh, Belgium. Uh, we have medium-sized uh, infrastructure solutions, so in the Czech Republic and um, in uh, oh, let's see, the Czech Republic and Austria. That's it. Really testing my geography here. And uh, large-scale catchment solutions are within uh, Germany and uh, in uh, the Netherlands. So if I just take you through the titles of the, the different uh, chapters, so the seven chapters, uh, at the small scale property rights, uh, we have uh, the first chapter there, I won't, I won't uh, uh, read them out, um, and you see the authors are uh, given underneath. But essentially in that, in that particular chapter, uh, small retention approaches in forest mountain areas of Poland. And there we find a situation where, um, even though there are stakeholders involved, actually it's the state that manages that particular situation, which actually is quite an advantage in terms of there's a clear hierarchical structure, and so upscaling is quite straightforward. The second chapter there um, looks at private self-motivated -motiv initiatives of a particular farmer, and it's viewed as a faster and cheaper uh, methodology of instigating approaches, but actually it is questioned as it may not only support but also undermine the public policy goals that might be in place within that region. The third chapter uh, is situated in Flanders, and there we look at while taxable land development rights and exchange of development rights and land um, pooling do exist as approaches, the issues of time and expense of compensation, allocation of development rights, and the compensation itself um, means that we revert back to the situation that is already in place. That is, the zoning is still preferred. At the medium scale, uh, we have two chapters. One, the first chapter focuses on cities, um, and there we're looking at urban wetlands and the cost-benefit analysis that we can then convey to decision makers to make those decisions. In that particular case, it's quite interesting that they found that the social benefits exceeded costs by almost 25 times. In that, uh, the second chapter on that page, we explore the regulatory spatial planning for um, retention and runoff to secure land. Here, the main issues that are brought up are about the longer time span that we have to deal with with nature-based solutions. And this often or can conflict with the static planning instruments, um, which, uh, which do not take into account the longer term um, adaptation and forward planning. And finally, we have the large-scale catchment solutions. The first chapter in this section challenges, looks at the challenges of reverting and gaining stakeholder acceptance um, to, of turning private agricultural land um, back into floodplain forests. 
And the final chapter looks at a climate change adaptation project and actually the challenges of dependence on voluntary actors and the actions of stakeholders. Um, this is overcome in terms of uh, lack of urgency or awareness amongst those groups with financial incentives and communication approaches. So quite a wide ranging um, set of chapters, but very much um, dependent on the scale of the approaches that we're looking at. Around those chapters, we have uh, uh, introductory chapters and also a commentary on scale, as you might expect. But more importantly, the final concluding chapter will try to um, sum up all the different approaches and challenges that have been found and then look to the future and what we can possibly look at um, to take this forward. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much so far. We have now two of the four present presenters. May me, may, let me please add that uh, the book is still in progress. And one special feature is that we will ask commentators to comment on the different cases from a different disciplinary angle. So it will be a discourse in a book, um, which is very exceptional, I guess. And um, I, I hope that we will succeed with that, and uh, we hope that this will be published in 2019. Um, before we switch to the next presenter, let me just check whether there are already questions popping up in the in the webinar section. On the, are there any questions already? Not yet. Okay, but if you have questions, just type them in in the whatever you see on your screen. Um, and um, uh, let me just briefly check if there are immediate raises of hands uh, in the audience uh, here in Riga already. Let's see. So we had the two presenters, one by Jochen Schanze on the special issue on uh, land for flood risk management and the second on the book proposal presenting the different cases on different scales. So is, if there is an immediate raise of hands, I don't see that right now. So then we we are perfect in time and we continue with the next presenter. And if you have questions, write them down and we will have a Q&A um, after the, the next two presentations, I suggest. Okay, let me introduce then uh, Lukas Löschner from, uh, from Vienna. And uh, Lukas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas. So this presentation is about um, a proposal actually for a special issue, it's still at the proposal stage and um, in my presentation I just want to give a brief conceptual overview of the intentions of the, the special issues and we're going to really focus and explore issues related to the instruments and the actual concrete policies which are needed to mobilize uh, and provide land for flood risk management. So uh, with the shift from flood protection to flood risk management and with the aim to provide land for flood risk management, we're actually facing concrete policy delivery gaps. Um, we know that there is a need to accommodate rather than accelerate flood discharge. We know that it is necessary to provide land for flooding, for flood storage, for flood corridors. We know that we have to mitigate levy effects and to prevent the accumulation of damage potential in protected areas. And there's a need to develop climate robust flood protection schemes. But all these policy intentions are actually hampered and restrained by the lack of availability of the accessibility of this privately owned land for flood risk management. And with the shift towards flood risk management, we're also facing a pluralization of, of actors and especially the introduction of non-state actors into the policy process. And with that, we're experiencing also an increase in the conflicts of interests between public interests and private interests, landowner interests, but also between upstream landowners and downstream beneficiaries, for instance. So we really have to explore issues on how to better mobilize the necessary land resources and to explore instruments and policies which are at our disposal to provide the land resources for the, the policy intentions. And also to explore how we can overcome these policy delivery gaps and that is the aim of this policy in, in, in this uh, special issue where we focus on the instrumental perspective. Okay, sorry. So why is it important to focus on policy instruments? Instruments, essentially, they, they are key to understanding the changing forms of governments we are facing from the shift from flood protection to flood risk management. 
And generally speaking, policy instruments are the techniques or means through which governments attempt to attain their aims and how intentions of policy are translated into operational activities. There's a wide range of typologies and, and, and to differentiate between policy instruments. One way is the so-called NATO scheme, uh, which differentiates different resources, resources which are at the disposal of governments to influence policy action. And NATO stands for nodality or information resources. Authority um, stands for the, the possibility to regulate and normalize behavior. Treasure, of course, the financial resources at the disposal of governments. And finally, organization or personnel resources to, uh, to implement action. Now, another differentiation is between carrots, sticks, and sermons. Carrots being economic instruments to incentivize or disincentivize behaviors. Sticks, of course, being regulatory instruments. And um, finally, sermons, communicative instruments to get stakeholders or other um, agents to, um, to act accordingly. They can also be differentiated on a scale from, uh, in a on a scale of coerci coerciveness between tough instruments or so coercive sanction-based instruments and tender instruments, so incentives, persuasion, capacity-building instruments. In another typology, we see a shift um, from classic instruments, so laws, taxes, which are um, uh, the introduction of new instruments, which rely more on negotiation and involving the addressees of policy action. Now, of course, the classic instruments are legislative regulatory instruments. Um, and referring to our topic, this is about land use regulations, um, but also transferable development rights, compensation rights, for instance. On the other hand, we have economic fiscal instruments, so taxes, but also the possibility to, to, to buy land, land acquisition, but also provide agricultural subsidies um, to provide repair and strips for flooding, for instance. Now, the new instruments rely more on negotiation, on involving um, the different stakeholders in the process, and there are maybe agreement or incentive-based instruments, such as inverse leasehold or upstream-downstream corporations. And finally, we have information and communication-based instruments, such as workshops, getting in dialogue with, uh, with these stakeholders. I'm just going to grab a sip of water. Now, what's crucial is that policy instruments um, are not just ready available. There's not just a toolkit for governments to choose from, but there's actually a number of factors influencing the choice of instruments. And there's a so-called five eyes factors of instrument choice, where um, Peters and Nispen say that instrument choice is influenced also by overarching ideologies. So if it's in a government setting where it, which is more market oriented or more government centralized, but there are of course also direct interests of the public bodies, what the concrete aim is of the instrument. And then there are also institutional factors which are important to consider. If we look at, for instance, spatial planning, spatial planning has a tendency to, to prefer regulatory instruments. Um, and also individual preferences and finally also the international environment for instance with the implementation of the eu floods directive this is a very important factor implement influencing the the changing shift in governance also so basically we have to look at and consider two context conditions on the one hand the systemic context on the other hand the institutional context the systemic context to sum up relates to the policy styles and the political cult culture is does the, does the, the government and the um the country have a status tradition and there of course is more there would be a congruence towards a greater acceptability of intrusive instruments and secondly in the institutional context we see that, that some organizations have a predisposition towards certain policy instruments and against certain instruments then of course certain organizations have specific target groups specific clientele so this, this is also another factor which needs to be regarded and finally finally the question, how are policy instruments developed? What is the policy community? How does how do policymakers interact with interest groups, but also with, with science and academia? And finally, it's also important, of course, to look at 
the effects of policy instruments. In traditional studies of policy instruments, it was all about the effectiveness. So it was a teleologic, teleologic view, a functional view of policy instruments, just to see whether the policy instruments actually achieved the intended aims. But with the pluralization of actors, with the pluralization of instruments, it's ever more important to take into account a broader scope um, of criteria for evaluating policy instruments. And this includes, of course, economic oriented criteria such as efficiency, but also democracy based criteria, concerning legitimacy, equity, transparency, and so forth, to just deepen the scope of inquiry um, when looking at policy instruments. So finally, for this um, special issue, we want to, on the one hand, look at specific policy instruments, um, see how they work, how they organize, but also to take into account the process, the policy instrumentation of these instruments, the effects of these policy instruments to build a better understanding of the instruments and the policies for mobilizing private flood, for flood risk management. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Lucas, for this for this introduction of a special issue. And what it shows is the multiple disciplinaries, uh, disciplines that uh, get involved into that issue of land for flood. And this is one activity of a special issue. And um, this is also uh, an invitation for you to consider writing a chapter, a paper for that special issue. If you if you're interested, check out WW Land for Flood or approach us in the coffee break. That accounts, of course, for those who are here. Um, uh, and, and again, if you have questions, write them down or use the screen thingy uh, and write them. They will reach us in some way or another. Uh, and I'm happy to then uh, um, present the, the last uh, speaker of, the, of, this, of the webinar, Lenka Slavikova, also the chair of the action, um, presenting another idea for a special issue. Lenka, the floor is yours. Okay, so finally, I will very briefly present the main ideas uh, of the another special issue, uh, which is called fin well, Working Title is Financial Schemes for Flood Recovery. Uh, again, we are in a very early stage, so we'll be happy if someone feels that the, your uh, that the, your research fits into the special issue. Please try to approach me here or via email that will be shown at, at the end of the presentation. We'll be happy to discuss if your topic just fits fits in. So, uh, why uh, recovery? Why recovery? Why we decided to focus on this uh, phase of the flood risk management cycle? Uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, and at this picture, uh, if you look at the internet, there is a plenty of pictures describing uh, what is the flood risk management cycle and what are the phases. And uh, there's a vast amount of uh, publications and research going on, especially on mitigation and preparation, which means, which is a uh, part of the cycle where there is no uh, immediate uh, danger. And uh, there's also nothing is damaged. So the flood is far away. We know there is some probability it will come again, especially to territories that are designated as floodplains, for example. Uh, but there is no uh, immediate problem. The recovery phase uh, comes very shortly after a flood, meaning that it's a special situation uh, in which people come back to their destroyed homes and the policy maker somehow feels that something needs to be done very quickly. Uh, and the focus, our focus is on financial schemes, which means they are uh, in this period uh, af after a plot, there are financial flows that tries to reach to these people or communities or cities affected by floods and occurring flood damages. And the question is, what is the best way to help those people or how, this, how, to, how to transfer this money and how to target them? Uh, and this picture, uh, the tricky, tricky part here is that the, during the recovery phase, the focus is given to repair the damage, 
very often as, as fast as possible uh, to bring people back into the normal life and to somehow uh, restore the economic activities. Because if you don't do it, then people feel stressed and the site is not working well. So this is a priority. On the other hand, and it's also very well uh, seen on this picture, it's, it's uh, it emphasized that you need to somehow identify mitigation opportunities, which means uh, to lower future flood damages. You, sh you should not only repair, but also to somehow consider future uh, damages and their mitigation. Uh, and I think, and this is interesting, these two parts are uh, uh, con controversial. It means you, you, can all, you can do one or another, but if you would like to do both together, it's very challenging and very often, financial flows after uh, a big flood are prioritizing repairing of damages and are somehow omitting the mitigation. So once the society is restored and the, and the damages are covered, we start to talk about mitigation again, but it's too late because there is something which is called the window of opportunity that opens after a disaster. And so it's a, it's a very short period of time, a few months, when you can really change something and people, although uh, affected, might be able to accept something, uh, some, some changes or to somehow uh, better reflect future risks because we all know, and there's also a lot of research going on about it, that the flat risk perception at the, at the level of household is very often very low which means people live at places, uh, with, with, with the, at the risky places. But if you ask them about what they do to protect themselves against flooding, they just very often say that not, not much. Yes, so uh, the recovery phase is something we should focus on if we address mitigation. So this is why we think uh, that this is interesting. And I say we, because it's not just me behind this special issue. Um, this work is done together with Thomas Hartmann from Wageningen University and Thomas Thaler from Boku University Vienna. Uh, okay, so why financial schemes? And what are financial schemes for flood recovery? I listed some of them that would probably come to your mind while speaking about it. So we've got uh, large public funds devoted to disaster recovery in many countries, but we also have public schemes for voluntary property acquisition, meaning that some in some countries, governments are keen to buy people out of risky areas immediately after the disaster, when the property is damaged. Uh, then we have a large vari variety of insurance schemes, being uh, purely private or mixed or purely public. Uh, so again, it's a huge issue. And we also have voluntary charity, and I'm, I believe I, I missed some specific schemes, and sometimes they're also mixed together within one state and it's very much state oriented policy so every state is doing uh, the own their own uh, policy in this sense so what are the topics uh, we will focus on uh, we think that financial schemes and who's who's paid when and uh, what are the conditions of providing money these questions are cu crucial to mitigate future damages I'm coming from the post-socialist country and uh, the typical story is that after a flood, the government finds uh, a lot of resources in a state budget on ad hoc basis and then pay people simply like that. So every damaged household, farm or, or farmer is gi given the subsidy to renew the property without any conditions. And if after two years the flood come again, it will it will happen again. In some countries, it's, it's one third of damages, and in other countries, it's all damages they have. Depends on how big is the so solidarity there. Uh, 
We also think that these kind of financial flows shape the individual expectation. So it, it somehow in, directly influence how people perceive uh, flood risks. Because if you're, if you're compensated for flood damages, you are less eager to move away from the risky areas. Uh, so it, it somehow influenced behavior uh, on the individual level, community level, or, or within a country. Uh, there are some studies showing that the, the more is done by the government, the less is done by people. So there is a crowding out of private activity, which is also quite well described phenomena in economics. There's nothing new and it also can be applied to reimbursement of flood damages. And very often, uh, most of the countries in Europe, let's say, say we speak mostly about Europe here, uh, do have uh, flood risk management strategies developed. So there is a comprehensive document, for example, Czech Republic saying what needs to be done to mitigate future damages. But after a big flood, everyone forgets it. All these principles that we should focus on prevention, they, we, just, we just pay uh, money to people as fast as possible. So it's also interesting why, <laughs> why is such a big gap between strategy and real policy action after in, in a recovery phase. And uh, this is mostly it. Uh, I'll stop here. I'll welcome your question. And if your research is focused on financial schemes, please feel free to talk to me and contact me. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks very much. Um, so what you see is we have uh, uh, different disciplines and you would expect with the topic of flood um, uh, that, that usually it's, it's much more technical, um, but you see what, that we have a mixture of all these different disciplines uh, and I, I need to emphasize, I'm quite happy with that, within this, this initiative, this cost network, we, we do not only have a, a, a very good balance of disciplines, proper di the balance of, of gender and uh, what the EU is calling inclusiveness countries. Uh, so, um, so we have a lot of, uh, a huge variety of people and, and countries involved in that initiative. Um, so first of all, I would like to, to, to also encourage those watching at home in your screens, I always wanted to say that, um, uh, the, the, those at your screens, um, uh, if you're interested, please uh, consider joining uh, the, the, the initiative. Um, we have some questions already uh, coming in from the webinar. I, I would suggest that I will now read out the questions of the uh, webinar and then uh, we, we uh, answer. I don't know, is it, is it a good idea if we, uh, if we stand with all the speakers here? Does that fit? Would, would that be an idea if you, if you come up front here and take one microphone and I will then uh, read out the questions? And if you have questions, we will deal with them as quickly as possible. So um, let's see. So, oh, there are many questions. Okay, let's, 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 let's uh, start somewhere. Um, So there is one question from Neil Gregg. Um, uh, are there any cases where land behind reservoirs can be flooded to a greater extent than the public land provides? That is, that private land can be flooded too. So, okay, so um, I don't know if that question is directed to someone in particular, but we'll, we'll read it again. I see uh, uh, question marks in the faces. There are, uh, are there any cases where land behind reservoirs can be flooded to a greater extent than the public land provides? That is, that private land can be flooded too. Um, okay, I will, I will just read them out and you, you will think about uh, the, these questions. The second question from Natasha Leader. Um, how would you advise enforcement measures when dealing with private landowners? I guess this one is directed to you, Lucas. Um, and uh, then there is a third question. Um, I don't know who wrote that, but it's uh, how does government utilize abandoned homes after occupants have been relocated? 
that's a challenging one, I guess. And um, yeah, th those are three questions. Um, so we need to use the microphone. Um, is there any first first reaction to any of those three questions? So how can how does government utilize abandoned homes after occupants have been relocated? So I guess that's reallocation. And um, so Lenka, would you you want to react to the last one? Uh, okay, so uh, I was referring to one uh, finan uh, fi financial program from the United States, uh, which I o o only read about. <laughs> and uh, there's an interesting article I could share. Uh, I don't remember the author right now, dealing exactly with this question, like what's done after people are bought out from the floodplains. And he's uh, analyzing that the, the land should belong to the city, organizing the bite out program with the use of the federal resources. And the idea behind this program, except of reducing future damages, is that there will be more green, open green spaces. And this would uh, increase the price of remaining buildings. So there will be higher tax collection by the municipality realized. So there will be extra money for the maintenance of these green spaces, which are ready to be flooded if there is a flood with very low damage, uh, which is a nice idea. The authors concluded it does not, uh, it did not work so well at, at the places they studied because uh, the city councils or city representatives does not care for these public state spaces so well, did not turn them uh, out into sport fields or parks, because uh, it would, this, was, this would require additional public resources for some minor investment and maintenance. So the authors see, seen it as a, as a failure of this program and to some extent that uh, they just increase number of, of somehow abandoned places in residential areas, which was maybe not the expectation, ex expectation. Yeah. So I can share the paper. I don't have it in my head now, but it was the effects of of uh, land use was analyzed already. Okay. Talking of the on the off now. Thank you very much. So um, it, it seems that the three questions we have addressed, like the three working groups, more or less, we have in the in the cost action. One is more on the, on the process, one more the object, and one the context of uh, of the topic. So the other one, um, uh, how would you advise enforcement measures when dealing with pr private landowners? So really about the question of implementing an instrument. Lucas, would you like to respond to that one? Um. So when it comes to enforcing these measures, uh, if we go back to the, the scale of coerciveness I, I laid out between instruments which really impose on private property rights and others which are less coercive and kind of provide incentives um, on the, the top end of that scale. So the most coercive is of course expropriation and this is something policy makers and, and the implementers of, of protection schemes and flood storage schemes, of course, see as a very, very last resort. Uh, in Austria, it is legally possible. Um, it's defined in, in, in the, the railway uh, railway law. I don't know if it's direct, direct uh, translation. But um, this is something which is very, very rarely executed. and usually they try to use other forms of instruments which um, if they know in advance if they need an area for flood storage then they would try to dedicate it and, and, and prevent land development on these areas to secure it for flood storage um, but of course they're increasingly developing negotiation based instruments where they try to develop um, incentives for the providers of flood storage land to provide this land or also to develop agreement-based instruments so where the beneficiaries of certain measures contribute to the compensation payments. So there's a strong focus on using less coercive legal instruments and economic instruments. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but um, this is just speaking for the Austrian context. Okay, thank you very much. I, I don't see any reaction from the webinar and also from the audience, I see one, one, one question from...
would you like to, to add immediately, Rachel? Okay. <laughs> okay, Rochelle Alterman from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology and the Neiman Institute for National Policy Research. My area is planning and uh, law. The uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation by Thomas and your uh, four wonderful initiatives are all very, very well uh, framed, I think. There is a very strong connection between the legal and the financial and um, the bottom line is money. The legal instruments, uh, all of them uh, translate into either money or money equivalents. And so um, I think it'll be very interesting to try and think tank the interrelationship between these uh, uh, two publication initiatives and research initiatives. And I really welcome, this is a very important land for a flood worldwide initiative. Okay, so um, that, that, that's a that, that's a comment. Thank 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 you very much. I don't have to. Okay, no, they couldn't react to that. If there's okay. Do you, any any reaction right now to the? Okay. Um, were you referring to the to the focus of the special issues, or just generally between um, between between the instruments? Um, no, yeah. Yeah, just in addition to these typologies, of course, this is their interrelations and, and economic instruments are also legal at the same time. It's just an, an, an attempt to kind of bring more structure into this very broad uh, understanding of instruments. Um, but like you said, ultimately it comes down to money and uh, even the legal instruments, which prevents land development, it comes down to um, how you can use the land and the value you get for the land, essentially. Very short comment. I agree. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, every financial inter instrument is uh, usually grounded in some legal uh, act of or legal decision, because otherwise you can't just spread out public resources. So it is interconnected. And thank you for that. I would also like to thank you for this comment. And I think it also shows us a gap, because so far we really have um, related but not integrated consideration of these two aspects. And maybe this is a task for the future activity within our cost action. And I think uh, in the UK, there's an interesting uh, issue in terms of uh, securing private land in that there is a legal expropriation of land possible, but it's used as a negotiation tool to try and keep things moving and also to come to a point of decision. So it can be used, but negotiation is much preferred because they, often those uh, landowners have other issues with those organizations besides flood risk. Okay, so I have um, two, two open questions now. Um, the first one, which we haven't dealt with yet, is the question um, uh, by uh, Natasha, uh, Neil Gregg, sorry. Are there any cases where land behind reservoirs can be flooded to a greater extent than the public land provides? That is, uh, can private land be flooded too? Um, uh, that, that, that seems to be a very basic question in the core of what, what we are dealing with. Uh, I think that's a very quick comment from, from one of you. I, Jochen, you? Uh, yes, I think um, reservoir, I think, is uh, related to uh, the construction of dams. And uh, of course, there are activities who can be uh, realized on private land, particularly of agricultural land. And uh, for example, uh, small detention ponds, which still can be used for agriculture is a development which shows that uh, this land need not be completely be kept out of the agricultural use, but can be have two functions. And this goes in the direction of multifunctionality and just needs a compensation for the farmers and the financing of the ponds. But uh, it's not a exclusion. However, so far, I do not know any legal possibility to force private uh, uh, landowners to do this, but to, again, come to negotiations and try to convince them. Okay, thank you very much. And I think I have a question that goes, I guess, to the whole audience and the whole cost action, because it's a general remark on the applicability of our cost action. So we'll read it out. It's from Barbara 
I hope I can pronounce that correct. Barbara Teixeira, if, if I'm not mistaken. So, so sorry if I pronounced it wrong. Barbara Teixeira wants to know, climate change and floods are very important in the movement of people nowadays. These cases show in studies where mainly in Europe, the, oh, the cases shown in these studies are mainly in Europe and in developed cities. So the cases we discuss. Um, are these models to be used also in cities or areas where there is already a higher risk of displacement because of floods and of violent conflict? So that question, of course, addresses the applicability of our whole action. We focus pretty much on, uh, on the developed cities and, and Europe. Um, and, and that's, of course, a big challenge for all of us. So I, I, I tend to throw these question, this question into the audience before I give you the, the chance to respond. Uh, any, anyone who wants to respond to our a bit Eurocentric uh, view on land for flood? Any, any reaction fr from, from the audience? We, we also have uh, participants from overseas, so let's see whether there is something, something to mention here. So the, the, the question, do, how do we deal with that in developing countries or outside Europe? Okay, no, no immediate raise of hands. Um, okay, what, what one, please? Um, I assume the question was oriented to developing countries uh, where very often um, the, the areas of, that are densely inhabited uh, often informally are also high uh, risk areas of various uh, kinds. Um, I think the Land for Flood initiative in, in its uh, hydrological and uh, environmental aspects is obviously universal. In the governance aspects, governance uh, is very much sensitive to many other factors. Um, and mostly, I think many of the instruments will be difficult to apply in uh, countries where governance is um, not very effective, where the legal capacities are uh, weak, but on the other hand, if it's negotiations based bottom up, and if there is enough financing, perhaps some of the instruments could work. Thank you, Rachel. And then there is, uh, Jochen, you would like to respond to that. And after that, I think we need to slowly close down the session. Let's see. Jochen, please. Yes, I highly appreciate this question because I think uh, in the countries which were uh, the basis for these cases, we had the research money to develop methods and tools, but now it's our responsibility to also try to transfer together with colleagues from developing countries and see how we can make use of these um, methods for uh, the benefit of these countries. And I just have been in, in Bangladesh uh, and uh, there are 10 million people who need to leave the coastline due to climate change uh, problems. And we have already started to apply methods uh, which we have developed and this can work. And this topic I would, would call uh, environmental migration. And this could also be something we could attach in the future within the cost action. Thank, thank you very much. Oh yeah, there's uh, one more reaction. Yes, I'm coming from developing country, Bosnia-Herzegovina. So um, yes, this cost action is very useful for uh, all country because uh, we can, we can have a valuable knowledge and already developed tools from developed countries. We don't have used our own resources to develop new tools and new maybe uh, possible approaches to preventing and overcome the damages from the floods. Of course, resources are needed, but we can use um, all knowledge from all around Europe that is already developed through the tools, resources and everything else and implement it in uh, particular cases and uh, the parts of the developing country that are suffering from, from the flood. So yes, this, this cost actions is uh, very valuable for developing countries in terms of knowledge exchange. Okay, so I need to check the time a, a, a tiny little bit. So we need to uh, conclude that session because we have more work to do in the, in the whole, in the whole um, uh, setting here. So I have to thank all the, the speakers, Lenka, Lukas, Simon and, and Jochen for their input. I would like to thank all of you uh, and I would like to thank also the uh, EWRA and the participants of the webinar. Again, www.landforflat.eu uh, and please um, feel encouraged to uh, engage in these publication activities. Um, consider submitting a paper or launch a new uh, uh, publication by yourself if you want. 
I need to check whether uh, Scott wants to conclude the webinar from his side, but I we think we need to conclude because we have a lot of work to do. Let's see. Nothing. Okay. So then uh, we just uh, we just conclude that uh, session. Oh yeah, there is. Uh, I see some activity. Let's see. Go ahead and finish up. It's fine. All right. Well, thank you everyone for for participating and and working with us today. Um, we really appreciate everything that you, you presented and provided for us. Um, I know that provided a, a lot of uh, thoughts and, and creativity for me, and, and I really enjoyed hearing and listening to that. And I think that a lot of people that uh, were watching online uh, from the level of questions that I heard, I thought people were really engaged with, with, with everything that's happening. And I was really excited on my side to, to hear about all the initiatives that are coming out. It sounds like this is not the wrap up, but really almost a launch event. Um, uh, I'd really like to thank everyone that was on our panel again today. Um, so thank you, uh, Thomas Hartman, for all your work organizing this. Um, Johan Schantz, uh, Simon McCarty, Lucas Loescher, and Lena Slavoshpa. Uh, thank you, all of you, uh, for, for participating and helping and giving us your insights here today. Um, I'd like to remind my audience, you know, that uh, many of the people on the panel and uh, IWRA itself are on Twitter. So go ahead and look them up and follow them if you're interested. Um, we'll have a summary of the of recording of the webinar. Uh, will be on our webpage uh, pretty soon in a few days. So if you want to go back and relive the best moments um, or to maybe just uh, listen to some things again that you um, want to engage with your own writing and your own work, uh, go ahead and go to our website and check that out. Also, you can go to LinkedIn. Um, where we'll have a short uh, discussion and if you want to continue to kind of uh, debate and talk about these issues uh, LinkedIn provides an excellent resource where you can do that so um, go ahead and check us out on social media check us out on our website um, I really hope that everyone in the audience found that the insights provided by the panel here today with this uh, special live stream from the EU cost action land for flood workshop towards an interdisciplinary understanding of the private land for flood risk management. Really just as fascinating as, as I did and as I think many of the audience members did. Uh, it's given so much material for me to think about in my own writing that I'm working on right now. So I know it'll be helpful for you as well. Um, I want to remind everybody again that the webinar was brought to you today by the International Water Resources Association, which is an over 40 year old nonprofit, non-governmental educational organization. We focus on bridging disciplines and geographies and connecting professionals, students, individuals, corporations, and institutions who are concerned with the sustainable use of the world's water resources. So if you're interested in learning more about the association or becoming a member, go to www.iwra.org. So the half on everyone in the whole IWRA office and the European Cost Action Land for Floods Network, uh, thank you for viewing the webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Okay. So. Then we are among us uh, again. Yes, cool. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so what to do next? Uh...